Hi, right, it's time for another math easy solution here to discuss. So, uh, well, basically, part two of the limit laws series, on a, and also a brief history lesson on limits here. Uh, basically, I just want to add a couple more laws to uh, the ones that I showed earlier. Basically, let's just go overview, uh, recap on the first five laws that I stated. Basically, limit laws uh, suppose that C is a constant and the limits below exist. Basically, limit of f of x as x approaches a and limit of g of x as x approaches a. So you get the sum law here when you have an addition here. You're just going to separate them like this. And law two is a difference, the same thing with the instead of a plus and minus. So you just do this one here. You can see more on the video link below. On uh, I go through these a bit more. And I'll uh, number uh, also do the proofs of these in later videos. And also this is a constant multiple law. You just take the constant out. That's constant c of the limit. And if you have a product uh, of of uh, if you have products, you take the limit. You can just separate them and take. The, product of limits here and also the quotient or division you can do this separately that's only if the bottom is not zero so now uh, let's go to law six this is the ones that uh, law six up to law eleven the ones for part two of this series basically now this one if we look at this product law here and if we let's say g of x equals f of x then you're gonna get uh, limit of f of x times uh, limit of f of x and you're just gonna have basically this power law if you keep doing that over and over again so you're going to have this power law here, so of limit of f of x to the power of n at x approaches a, then you can just put that inside this bracket here into the power of n here. So this one is basically, yeah, this one's done or shown by uh, basically repeating law 4 with g of x equals f of x. Yeah, like I stated uh, just, just now. So basically that's called the power law. And now the, to apply these laws, these next two laws, 7 and 8, are used in applying them. Basically if you have a limit of, uh, of just a constant c of x approaches a, you're just going to get c here. You can see that visually if you have just a constant, let's say this is C, and this is, let's say, A here. As you're approaching it, you're always going to stay on C here. So you're always going to stay on this whatever it is. But uh, the more explicit proofs, I'll show these in our later videos as well. And also for this one here as well, if you have a limit of, of X, as X approaches A, you're just going to go to A here. That's just going to be just a straight line like this. This is Y equals X here. So if you go to A, it just you're just going to reach reach A here. So if you're going to A, you're just going to reach where this is A. So, uh, but yeah, you can see that this is obvious, but the proof of them uh, using the precise definition, which I'll show in the later videos, is just a bit more complex. So now let's look at Law 9. This is basically Law 9's view, uh, combine Law 8 and Law 6 is power, power law here, but if you let f of x equal to x here, then you'll just have this one right here. So uh, you just have limit as x to the n of x a just equals a, and this is only where n is, a, yeah, so this is basically where n is a positive integer for this proof here. So you just plug that in here. And also law 10, now if we look, you could do similarly, number of the proofs, I'll do these later, but anyway, I just want to go over these quickly. So the limit, now you could do this for roots. So if this was a root now, you could do the similar to this power law, uh, this power function here, but using roots here. So you just, if you have a limit of, of this here, you can just plug that in, just going to be a n, where n is a positive integer here. And also, if n is even, then assume this a is greater than or equal to 0, because you can't have a negative there. But if it's uh, odd, you could have, let's say, something like, yeah, something like this here. So if it's, uh, you could have a negative, if this is a, a, an odd number here, because then you're just going to get negative 3 as the answer. Because negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9 times it by negative 3 is negative 27 here. But if you have an even number, you're always going to get positive, so you can't have a negative number inside here unless you deal with imaginary numbers. So now if we look at law 11, this one's just more general of this. Instead of using this, 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 um, x equals, yeah, basically f of x equal to x, you could just, just plug in the f of x here. And then the inside is going to be the limit as x approaches a of f of x. So you could just, if you have something like this, you could just put the limit inside. Also the proof of this I'll show later. Basically, you notice where n is positive integer, and if n is even like above, just assume that whatever's inside the square root is greater than or equal to zero, and this is called the root law. So I'll do examples later in uh, of this, but uh, before I just want to go over some you know, just a brief history lesson on this. This is found it interesting. My calculus book had this brief summary of Newton and limits here. Basically, Isaac Newton was born on Christmas Day. This is a day, not a dat. So yeah, Christmas Day in uh, 1642, and this is actually the year Galileo died. And he's another mathematician, a pretty brilliant guy. But then basically, when he entered, when Isaac Newton entered Cambridge University in 1661, Newton didn't know much about mathematics, so he was pretty young here. But uh, was in 19, I think. Uh, but he learned quickly by reading Euclid and Descartes. I'm not sure this guy, another mathematician, but and also attending lectures of Isaac Barrow. I did a brief overview of this guy. Uh, 
in the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. You can see the video link below. You can learn more about him. And basically, Cambridge was closed for two years in 1665 and 1666, and Newton returned home to reflect on what he learned. In those two years, he learned a lot. He was really productive, and he made, uh, at that time, he made four of his major discoveries. Uh, number one here is representation of functions as sums. Yeah, as sums of infinite series, including the binomial theorem, so he invented that, and also his work on differential integral calculus, his laws of motion, and universal gravitation, also his prism experience on nature of light and color here. So he did a lot of stuff in those two years when school was out. And uh, because of fear of controversy and criticism, he actually was reluctant to publish his discoveries of all that and, of, and, of, and later on stuff. And it wasn't until 1687 here, so this is about... How much years is that? Uh, over 10 years, over 10, 15, or 20 years later, at the urging of astronomer Haley, that Newton published Principia Math Mathematica. Is, and this one is basically, in this work, the greatest scientific treatise ever written. Newton set forth his version of calculus use it, and used it based on investigating mechanics, fluid dynamics, and wave motion, and also to explain the motion of planets and comets. So he did a lot of stuff. In this uh, in this book here that uh, you p eventually published due to the urging of this guy, pretty uh, I think this is a pretty top-notch guy. But anyways, and also uh, so basically now the beginnings of calculus just go back a bit even further beyond uh, Newton. Uh, calculus are found in calculus of areas and volumes by ancient Greek scholars such as Eudoxus, I don't pronounce it, and Archimedes. Although aspects of the idea of limit are implicit in their method of exhaust, exhaustion. They do a basically over and over again kind of method, and it's implicit to it, but it's not explicitly stating it's a limit. And basically, yeah, they never explicitly formulated the concept of limits here, which is uh, yeah, which is really important. And basically, likewise, mathematicians such as Cavalry, Fermat, and Barrow, yeah, Isaac Barrow, the immediate precursors of guys right before Newton and development of calculus, did not actually use limits. And it was Isaac Newton who first was the first to talk explicitly about limits. And he explained that the main idea, this is not spelled wrong, yeah, the main idea behind his limits is that quantities approach nearer than by any given difference here. So whatever you are, you're going to get nearer and nearer whenever you're close to it. I think that's what he's trying to say. But anyways, that's basically the kind of idea of the limit. So if you have something like this, so the quantities, if you go just pick any given difference here, then they approach nearer and nearer always. Anytime you pick a difference, you're going to get nearer and nearer. And that's the idea, kind of basic idea of limits. And also, yeah, Newton basically, yeah, he stated that limit was the basic concept in calculus, but it was left to later mathematicians like Cauchy to clarify his ideas about limits. Well, uh, that's all for today. I hope you learned about this brief history lesson. I found it really interesting. And yeah, just get to just understand a lot how much has gone through into calculus and who, who were the major players in it. And also, if you learn about these limit laws, uh, these uh, part two of this series, I'll do some examples uh, later videos, and also proof of every one of these laws in explicit fashion using the precise definition of a limit, which I'll go over later on. Hopefully you learn anyways, and remember to download these notes in the Dropbox link below, and stay tuned for another math easy solution.